So welcome to Half Past Capitalism, uh, where we talk about alternatives to capitalism as if they were possible. Uh, we're lucky today to have two guests who are going to talk about what we'll call Hall Socialism, uh, a community-based and culturally grounded approach to transformative politics that happened, uh, or that we're going to talk about happening in the early 20th century, um, that became foundational to leftist and socialist traditions in Canada. Uh, so Cassandra Luciuk uh, is a, a historian who has studied the history of Ukrainians in Canada, has written books and articles about the history of World War I internment camps, uh, the threads of anti-communist consciousness and Canadian history. Uh, and of particular note today, the Canadian, uh, sorry, the Ukrainian left in Canada. Uh, welcome, Cassandra. Thank you. Thanks. And also we have uh, Saku Pinta, uh, currently at the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, but also a labour historian uh, who's focused on left and labour movements within Finnish communities in North America, uh, and above all, the experience of the industrial workers of the world. Welcome, Saku. Thanks, Drew. Excited to be here. Great. So um, before we get into the world of Finns and Ukrainians in the early 20th century, uh, I wanted to talk uh, about life in the 21st century, um, where we are right now. Um, and as I warned, I like to start the show with a question. What was the last time in your daily life um, capitalism was was like notably present as capitalism? Um, I mean, I live in Ontario, so I think that's like a full, good enough answer. But, uh, you know, I think the the examples I think are, are, are really endless, right? From, from four rejecting paid sick days, 23 times, um, you know, the inequities with the vaccine rollout, uh, the way in which racialized and working class folks are disproportionately getting sick and dying, um, you know, the gaslighting of essential workers with these sort of vapid celebrations of them while getting absolutely no material benefits. So, I mean, I think that my overall experience of, of coping or, or lack thereof sometimes with the pandemic has really been heavily influenced by the way in which the needs of capital have made things so much worse than they needed to be for basically everyone except for, you know, Canadian billionaires who I think last time I checked in had made like 60 plus billion dollars since the pandemic began. Um, so that's certainly part of it. But I, I think at the, at the same time, when it comes to me individually, I, I think it's really worth pointing out that, you know, I'm economically precarious as a graduate student, but I'm also exceptionally privileged in that I get to work from home and I can, you know, afford the jacked up prices of click and collect groceries that I have no choice but to buy from a, you know, monopoly grocery store, which is yet another beautiful interaction with, uh, with capitalism, but this is very much so the other way that I experience it in that um, I, I currently occupy a, a space within it that doesn't require me to put myself in dangerous way for social reproduction to chug along. And I'm, I'm really hyper aware of that in, in this context. I, I'm going to defer to Cassandra on this one. She's, she's going to, she gave a much better answer uh, than I would. I would just go to the um, uh, very much the technical aspect, which uh, I experience capitalism by going to work, um, by paying bills, uh, you know, uh, I, I rent myself for, for wages and, uh, and I have to pay for the goods and services that, um, that I need to live. So that's a, uh, that's a daily uh, experience, uh, not today, of course, because it's May Day and I'm uh, not working, but um, uh, that is, uh, the, you know, the, the, like the Wu-Tang Clan said, uh, cash rules everything around me, right? And I think that uh, that pretty much sums it up for me and my experience with capitalism. The basic explanation for all the things you listed is basically just that, you know, capital, you know, as a sort of a force um, will sort of choose and have the people who are who are conducting affairs on its behalf choose profit over, you know, human misery so, or sorry profit um over the lack of human misery like over and over again it, do you think there's something more to it than that or is it is it that simple is it just like um when you have the when you have the the option of you know keeping people healthy uh versus not um you just you just choose the profit every time uh or or is is there something more sophisticated going on yeah i, I think that's it i don't think it's very sophisticated at all I think I think you nailed it. Uh, 
uh, let's move on to the actual topic at hand, uh, which is um, the world of Finns and Ukrainians in the early 20th century. However, uh, I'm going to defer that one more time. And I just, I just, I want to, I want to start with basically what I see as sort of like, uh, usually like the last chapter of the leftist book. And I'm mostly speaking about myself here, like having written like a, you know, a critique of a bunch of things. And then at the end, you're like, oh gosh, we, we have a deadline. We have to have some hope at the end. So like, let's write <laughs> chapter 10 in like 24 hours. <laughs> and it's going to be like 10 pages and it's going to like list a bunch of things that we could do. But, but I want to sort of like, you know, this is a, a hopeful show. So I want to like flip that and bring that up to the top. So, so my question to start is like, before we get into any of the details, like, what do you see as the sort of main lessons uh, or useful, um, I guess, conclusions that you can draw from your respective in-depth study of, uh, of what we're going to call Hall Socialism today? Uh, Saku, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. So, um, in terms of the lessons, the historical lessons and what, what might be relevant today, I think that Hall Socialism provides a powerful example of the fact that hungry fighters are not good fighters. And the Halls were able to uh, feed not only bodies, uh, but minds and uh, souls, if you permit me the, the use of that term. Um, and they did so by uh, catering to the, the varied interests of the communities that they were located in. So any, uh, and I'm speaking here solely of the, the Finnish halls, but and Sandra can, can chime in on the Ukrainian examples, but there was so many different kinds of activities from uh, athletics to theater, to uh, union activity, to uh, educational stuff. Um, so these all kind of fed into each other and they were, they formed this kind of um, movement infrastructure that was really critical in the success of, uh, of strikes in particular, but I think it really speaks to uh, also the, the longevity of these movements. So they, uh, some of the, the Finnish halls survived much later into the 20th century than uh, perhaps a lot of other left-wing institutions and um, I think they did so largely because of the support and the solidarity and the, um, the different kinds of uh, nourishment that, that those provide, that the halls provided to movements. Yeah, the, the Finnish labor temple was like my, my sort of like North Star in uh, every time I'd be in Thunder Bay for, for years. And I actually did an event there a few years. I was really sad to hear that it, that it finally has been privatized but uh but it certainly had a long run um what about you uh cassandra what uh, what lessons do you draw yeah so i i think there's a few things that i i think are really important and they they sort of tie into what to what saku's already said but i i think the ultimate power of hall socialism was just that way that it touched its constituents in this very wholesale way and you know we can get into to this in more detail later but you know, the halls weren't just about propagating politics as we understand it in a traditional sense and more about building working class consciousness in a variety of ways, none of which ultimately would then trump the other. So being part of the Ukrainian Labor Farmer Temple Association or the ULFTA meant that you and your, your family would enter into a space that would take care of you and engage you in every sense imaginable, right? From shielding you from political repression to teaching you how to Ukrainian dance, right? And, and that was the political project. And it really brought in a lot of people and, and forged this almost um, like impenetrable working class consciousness amongst its members in a way that I'm not really sure that we've seen replicated since. So I think the lesson that we can draw from that is, is beyond um, workplace organizing, which is a sort of separate, very important thing. If we want to organize communities, I think it's, it's fruitful to bring people in around something that's already familiar to them, um, like their ethnicity in the, this case, and to then offer them something material that is otherwise inaccessible to them under capitalism, right? Whether that's, you know, free dance lessons, literacy classes, or, you know, just a place to go 
and commiserate and maybe even turn that into sort of some kind of grassroots collective action. Um, and to also to, to kind of cast our political nets pretty wide. Um, what made the Yule FTA so, so special was that it didn't force political identity to look a particular way and it didn't really hit people over the head with the correct line, right? It really focused on building an extensive infrastructure for the community and it understood that as being very politically useful. Um, and by extension, I think that, you know, that community building made people much more receptive to broader working class solidarity, right? Like if you're part of a group that's meeting your needs and you feel an affection towards them, you want to see others have that too. So it was and is a really good way of, of countering any sort of resentment that can um, sometimes prevent folks from joining a cause or engaging in solidarity efforts. Um, and I, I think more seriously that we might see in, in sort of more recent times that might even uh, turn them in the other sort of direction if you catch my drift. Um, secondly, I, I think one of, um, one of the things that eventually accounts for the Yule FTA's uh, demise was this kind of imposition of an authoritarian kind of centralized top-down uh, sort of like leadership and sort of political style. Um, like the third period in, in particular made it basically impossible to, to continue with their successful organizing strategies because it prevented them from using things like language and ethnicity as a catalytic factor. Um, I think, you know, there's, there's lessons for this in the contemporary left, not in the sense that we have a, a common turn, um, but, you know, in the sense that sometimes I think we can get distracted from expressing working class power or we inadvertently squash organic expressions of working class consciousness or culture because we're too focused on, you know, like getting the line correct or increasing members or union dues and so on. Um, and then lastly, very quickly, um, I think there's, there's, there's something to be said, sorry, I'm very excited about the ULFTA, um, but I think there's something to be said for, for the praxis of, of the Ukrainian left when it was at its peak, right? Everything was done through direct collective action by members for other members. And there was basically no social mediation or reliance on formal politicking, right? And I don't think I need to, to sort of like tell anyone here that that's a, a sort of good, ad, uh, good strategy for, for organizing in, in today's climate, so. I think there's a, there's a, a few threads I just wanna um, to try to condense into a, a quick follow-up, which is, but just generically, like if I was gonna start a community hall that, that provided the sort of like um, food for the soul, food for the, the body, et cetera, um, and, that, and that created this more holistic um, context of sort of mutual aid and solidarity that, you, that you're talking about and, and obviously also political development. I feel like the things that I would immediately run into would be that, um, well, first of all, that there's already a bunch of spaces like that that the government uh, is, is funding or that like local, um, local elites uh, you know, within any particular community are sort of managing. Uh, and then there's, uh, there's a whole layer of like NGOs that are there to sort of provide a bunch of those services um, and, and, and so on. So there's, there's this whole free co-optive layer that's already in place that makes it very hard to break through and, and actually meet a need because needs are being met, but in this very like siloed sort of um, professionalized ways. Uh, and so I'm, 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 I guess I'm curious is there something about the context in which hall socialism happened that made it um, where, where there was more of a vacuum, maybe where there was where, where those needs weren't being weren't being addressed at all, and so it was, it was there was a lot more of a, a kind of a, a wide open terrain in order to be able to establish these kinds of spaces, or, or were there similar things happening back then too? I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out whether you know how how to sort of frame this, but I'm not sure that there's uh, a right or wrong answer. So I'll just sort of maybe say a few things all at once and then we can we can decide together what we think of it. But um, I think there is something very uh, context, time and place specific to what Hall Socialism was able to accomplish. I was thinking about this actually um, when, when, we were, when we sort of briefly touched on the, the, the labor temple in, in Thunder Bay. And you know, I think one of the really um, 
one of the really successful things about the labor temples was that they kind of existed in this very particular moment in the settler colonial project where you were, you know, you and your comrades could just like buy this super cheap piece of land and like throw up a labor temple on the weekend. And that's not something that we can really do anymore. I don't think the collective left in Toronto could afford one building here. Um, you know, Saku can talk a bit more about the way this is, you know, if you want that these things were really complicated in Thunder Bay. So I think that um, in that sense, there's something very specific about when these things appeared that made them possible that I'm not sure we could quite physically, you know, physically recreate, forget all the kind of like acroma that then goes on inside. Um, but then, you know, at the same time, at least in the Ukrainian case, you know, there weren't, you know, formalized NGOs in the same way, but there were community elites who created their own competing organizations and halls. Um, particularly in the 1930s onwards, we saw government bureaucracies established around trying to acculturate Ukrainians and to particularly instill in them anti-communism. Um, and so uh, there, there were a lot of those same things. Um, but I think what really drew people into the uh, labor temple specifically was that it was just explicitly leftist right and that was there there had to be that right like you wouldn't enter those halls if you were you know like a, a you know conservative ukrainian but you just like really wanted to do culture right like you wouldn't go there so i think it is possible in the sense that if we created like explicitly leftist spaces that then serviced maybe these other things maybe not ethnicity as you say but other things that we could recreate some of that um, sort of like organic grassroots, like community building. But yeah, so I think it's like both very context specific, but also we've seen these things before and we can work around them. I don't know if that's helpful, but. Yeah, no, definitely helps set, set the stage. Saku, do you have any reactions to that? I mean, the, the conditions that led to the rise of Hall socialism uh, in North America, they, they can't be recreated. Uh, the, the Finns, a lot of the Finns that came over um, a drop in the bucket, really, when it uh, when you compare it to um, other immigrant groups, you know, three hundred thousand or so uh, before nineteen fourteen, so before the, the first world war, and they were fleeing uh, czarist repression. I mean, they're basically leaving Finland at that time uh, was not a, an independent nation state, so they were leaving um, uh, uh, at a at a highly politically charged time and um, they, they've had experiences that uh, that we can't re recreate today and I, I imagine it's much the same um, in the Ukrainian context but having said that I mean I've been fortunate enough to visit um, a number of social centers in Europe um, in Italy and Greece in the UK and Finland uh, and other locations where uh, I think uh, if you if you took somebody from the early 20th century and you drop them into a social center in in Europe, I think they'd see a lot of uh, familiar things. Uh, there, there'd be a lot of um, there'd be a lot to to sort of identify with there. So um, so I do see that you know they're in in certain parts of the world and maybe even Canada perhaps in a in a, a slightly different form. We see these kinds of um, community centers functioning, but um, but in a different way. And and you you touched on the 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 role of the state and uh, and the way that um, you know you have these these sort of double edged swords where you see the expansion of the welfare state and a lot of uh, gains for working class people, um, but at the same time it comes with a a kind of a political cost where a lot of these movements then become very bureaucratized. And uh, that's very foreign to the to the whole socialism experience. These were very democratic spaces um, and extremely participatory spaces as well. So, um, so I see some differences today, but you know, some examples I think that um, are, are similar to the to the whole socialism experience. So I think I think that leads really well into 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 you know let's let's get into the the heart of the matter, I guess. Um, can you paint a picture of like what, um, like just like one like one person who would be involved in 
who would go to one of these halls? Um, like what kind of work would they be doing? What kind of background would they have? What kind of experiences might they have had that sort of led into their participation um, in, in, a, in a socialist you know, community hall? Uh, Cassandra, do you wanna start? Sure, yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll try to paint a, a broad overview. Um, so hall socialism in the Ukrainian case centered around these, these labor temples, which we sort of uh, talked a little bit about already. Um, they were built across the country, mostly in the early 20th century by left-wing Ukrainian migrant workers, most of whom were involved in sort of industrial work, um, in, uh, in farming, um, in railroad construction. Um, those were some of the, the sort of main industries um, in which they found work. Um, there were several iterations of the organization that represented them, um, but the most notable one was the ULFTA, which I already mentioned, and this was um, kind of a, a pseudo official language federation of the Communist Party of Canada and, and Saku might, might challenge me on that, but um, it was, I, I would call it sort of pseudo official, but um, at least in, in, in the third period, but before the third period rather, um, the ULFTA operated in this really democratic participatory way with minimal ideological oversight. Um, and that really meant that the, the tent for who participated was really quite broad. Like the, the ULFTA had um, you know, anarchists, socialists, trots, communists, social democrats, um, some small L liberals, um, some Stalinists eventually, um, some came to Canada with these politics already extant. A lot of them were members of, of the radical left in Ukraine still. Um, and others developed these politics once they got here and kind of got a taste for, for life as migrant workers under um, capitalism and under Anglo supremacy. Um, but they all, they all believed in, in the class struggle. They, they all believed in the revolution. They all supported the overthrow of capitalism. Um, their politics were intersectional. They were early adherents of um, indigenous black and women's liberation. Um, most were union members or, or wanted to be union members um, when they were extended the franchise, which came in, in 1920, they voted for socialist, uh, progressive and communist candidates. Um, they participated in all sorts of strikes and protests for a variety of left-wing causes. I think the most um, famous example of this is that um, the, the Labor Temple in Winnipeg served as one of the headquarters for the Winnipeg General Strike. And all this really um, united um, this sort of like large conglomerate of, of, of people, um, but they were also really united around their ethnicity. And I think that that created a lot of like tolerance between these, these various um, political factions. But ethnicity was, was um, was really intrinsically um, tied to their politics, not just in that kind of hyper-specific sense that a lot of their gripes with capitalism intersected with their identities as migrants, but also in that broader sense that it was this really effective um, marker for, for organizing. Um, so yeah, I've, I've sort of already mentioned this, but I think one of the things that, that made Hall Socialism so, so special was that it really was this kind of um, lifeblood of the movement and it served as a kind of one-stop shop for its members. So it had all the kind of traditional fixings of a political outfit, right? You had like a newspaper, you had an activist wing, you had a group of intelligentsia, um, but it also had all these other things. So just to kind of like list some of them off, um, to sort of show you how comprehensive this was, um, the ULFTA had a cradle to grave, uh, cradle to grave welfare state in the form of the Workers Benevolent Association, which provided um, sick death benefits, but also operated a retirement home and an orphanage. And this is well before the state catches up, right? Um, there was unemployment assistance. So there was monetary assistance, but there was also job retraining programs. Um, and there was also help with the kind of bureaucratic aspects of losing work, right? And that was super, super helpful during the, the depression in particular. Um, it ran schools for children. There were literacy classes for new immigrants. It provided um, free, free childcare. There was a soup kitchen and it basically there was an open door uh, sort of kitchen policy so that its, its members were always fed. Um, and I, I don't know if we can compete with the, the, the Finnish restaurant, but we tried. Um, 
there were women uh, and youth sections. Um, there were there were co-ops. There were bookstores. There were business ventures. Like they ran printing presses. Um, and then there was also this like super robust cultural program. You know, you could learn an instrument. You could learn how to dance. You could sing in a choir. You could perform some theater. Um, so it really spoke to its adherents, you know, along political lines, ethnic lines, and socio-cultural uh, lines. Um, and you know, you know, I think Ukrainians really, really turned to the organization to help them make sense of their exploitation as, as migrant workers. They turned to the organization to help them cope with xenophobia and Anglo supremacy. It fulfilled their needs and um, protected them psychologically, monetarily, sometimes even quite physically when the state had no interest in them. Um, it comforted their homesickness. It let them express themselves culturally. Um, so it was this kind of really good outlet for their socioeconomic uh, needs and this kind of vessel for radical change. And I think this sort of enhanced um, their sort of politics and, and working class consciousness as a result. So. It sounds incredible. Um, Saku, do you wanna give the, the, the portrait of the, the finished example? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as a kind of a preamble, uh, the, the Finnish left uh, was was fairly divided in North America. So if you kind of zoom out and you look at the macro view, uh, there were uh, by the late 20s, certainly by the 1930s, there were three kind of distinct uh, currents within the Finnish left. So there was a, a social democratic current that was more moderate, more reformist minded. There was a communist current that was very much looked to the Soviet Union and to international communist parties uh, for inspira inspiration and, and for a, a political line often. And uh, there was the IWW current. Um, so these kind of all came out of uh, similar organizations. The Finnish Socialist Federation of the United States is formed in um, Minnesota in 1906, uh, becomes the first and largest uh, language federation of the Socialist Party of America. Um, by 1914, uh, that splits and um, pro IWW elements are uh, leave or uh, or are expelled uh, from the organization. Uh, they start a competing uh, newspaper. Uh, there's an analogous split in Canada. Um, the uh, Finnish uh, Socialist Organization of Canada is formed in 1911. Um, very much modeled on the on the Finnish Socialist Federation in the United States. Um, so there's this there's this wobbly element that then comes out of that uh, in Canada as well within the Finnish community, and in the within the Finnish Canadian left specifically, uh, the social democratic uh, uh, current was wasn't as pronounced as it was in the United States. So uh, for decades, the the left was kind of dominated by uh, the Finnish organization of Canada. Um, uh, both uh, at different times of it in its history, it was either a direct component of the Communist Party of Canada as the Language Federation, and at a later stage, a, um, a less formal uh, association. And uh, the CTKL, the Kanadan Teolisus Tuelast and Kanatuslito, everybody say it along with me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with an auxiliary organization of the IWW. So that's kind of the, the broad sort of political landscape within the Finnish left in North America. And if you kind of zoom in, um, since we've talked about the, the Finnish Labor Temple in Thunder Bay, I'll kind of start there. Um, so that's on 314 Bay Street in Thunder Bay, formerly the twin cities of Port Arthur and Fort William. Uh, Bay Street in Thunder Bay, uh, really couldn't be that uh, more different from Bay Street in Toronto. Um, Bay Street in Thunder Bay was very much a, um, a hotbed of, uh, of leftist activity. So you had not one, but two Finnish labor halls uh, side by side. So the labor temples on 314 Bay Street and its neighbor at 316 Bay Street is the Finnish organization uh, Labor Temple, uh, which is, of course, uh, has this affiliation with the Communist Party. And they, um, I guess, Finns are really good at uh, infighting, and that's been proven to me uh, time and time again. But uh, you have these two kind of uh, brother enemies side by side, 
uh, organizing the same workers. So if we're, if we're looking at Northern Ontario, uh, really we're looking at lumber workers, uh, especially amongst the Finns. Um, in other parts of the province, uh, going to the Northeast, Sudbury, Cobalt, uh, Timmins area, Kirkland Lake, uh, you're, you're talking more about mining in those communities. Um, so, uh, but with uh, Thunder Bay, a large uh, uh, segment of uh, lumber workers, uh, two competing unions, the, the communists by the mid 1920s had the Lumber Workers Industrial Union of Canada and the IWW had the almost identically named Lumber Workers Industrial Union uh, number 120 uh, of the industrial workers of the world. So they organized within the same ethnicity, they organized amongst the same workers. And since my hall is the labor temple, um, I'll just give a kind of a brief description of, of uh, you know, if you imagine going back in time uh, into the into the mid 1920s, uh, what things would look like, and I'll I'll describe that through the eyes of uh, of Nick Vita. Uh, Nick Vita was a wonderful, uh, long time IWW organizer uh, in and around the Lakehead. Uh, born in Finland, he comes over uh, early 20th century. He's 12 years old uh, with his siblings and his mother to Sault Ste. Marie up the Algoma Central Line to a lumber camp. Uh, where his father worked. His father had been in Canada already six years. Uh, so Nick Vita joins the IWW in 1917 at the age of 15. Uh, he had to make a special request to the camp delegate because the camp delegate only um, made union membership mandatory on adults. So Nick joins the union at 15, witnesses um, what in essence is a mass strike IWW strike uh, along the uh, lumber camps of the Algoma Central in 1918. Uh, he studies at the Work People's College uh, in Duluth, which was a residential labor college uh, built by the IWW or, or um, maintained by the IWW for, uh, for several decades. And he relocates to Thunder Bay. He becomes the manager of the Hoito restaurant in, uh, in 1925, the Hoito restaurant, this is in the basement floor of the Finnish Labor Temple, um, started by Lumberjacks, uh, IWW Lumberjacks in 1918. They pulled their money together, created a cooperative restaurant. Um, they purchased weekly meal tickets, a very democratic functioning sort of organization. Their executive, basically their executive would change, three members would drop out every three months so there's a, a very high degree of uh, rotation uh, within the executive body. Um, so you have this community restaurant managed by Nick Vita, who is also the stationary IWW delegate. So union activity is very important, not only in the restaurant, but in the hall as such. So you have union offices on the second floor, a large uh, auditorium with a stage uh, that hosted, uh, I mentioned theater before, uh, which is a very sort of central uh, activity, uh, served also as a, as a fundraiser oftentimes, also served to um, instill political or economic lessons in, um, in a lighter sort of way. You know, people don't always like to be hit over the head with books, um, especially after working an eight or 12 hour day. But if you come to uh, watch some theater, um, maybe those, um, those lessons can be imparted much easier that way. So theater was a, was a large part of, of what happened in the hall. Uh, political groups, uh, education, libraries, um, and, uh, and athletics. I mentioned athletics before. Uh, the Finnish IWW uh, Sports Club uh, was in true IWW humor was called uh, Nahius, which means uh, slowpoke, basically. Uh, so they chose an ironic name um, for their athletics association, and they participated in gymnastics, track and field, uh, boxing. Uh, these are some of the, the, the big sports uh, that, that they, and they had a separate sports field, as a matter of fact, uh, both halls did. So, um, so this kind of gives you a, a, a bit of um, a, a, a broad sort of look at the different kinds of activities. And somebody like Nick Vita, um, manager of the Hoito for, I think, a period of six years through the 20s and into the 1930s. Uh, he's the stationary delegate, so he's handling union supplies, um, signing up members, keeping members in good standing. Uh, as a union delegate, 
uh, managing the cooperative restaurant. But these, uh, Nick and his wife Hanna are also uh, very much participating in the cultural life as well. So uh, they're participating in plays and choirs and uh, and all these other kinds of activities that are um, that are happening in the hall. So um, yeah, I think that that gives a, a, a kind of a decent overview of of what was going on at any given time in, in one of these halls in the early 20th century. Amazing. It sounds truly Amazing. vital. And it sounds like the soccer match or track meet or whatever between the two labor halls on their separate fields would be uh, the epic showdown. It's not to be missed. <laughs> That's right. Um, I want to pick up on the thread of cooperatives for a second because you both mentioned them and obviously that's sort of a central topic of the show um, and, and the sort of, I guess, I guess the, the essence of that being demo democratized, communally owned economic activity basically uh, that, that creates, um, if not an alternative to capitalism, certainly a, a, a temporary reprieve from it. Um, can, can you talk a bit more about um, how that fit into the whole thing and, and any sort of um, successes or limitations of, of the, the cooperative movement in those contexts? Um, start with uh, Saku. Sure, yeah. Um, the Finnish left, um, you, the, the cooperatives have a very long history in Finland uh, and they've been incredibly successful. Retail grocery in Finland to this day is basically a duopoly where there's one retail grocery chain that's a, a standard sort of privately owned one and another one that's a, a cooperative, cooperatively owned one, um, you know, and that's takes it has about 50 percent market share. So the Finn leftists, it, this is a long tradition in Finland. So mm -hmm. it's a very familiar sort of ownership model uh, that was um, that was applied in Canada and the United States as well by Finnish immigrants. Um, you know, when you look at Bay Street and Thunder Bay, uh, the, the IWW Finns had their, the People's Co-op um, and the, the Communist uh, Finns had the, the International Co-op. Um, but, you know, uh, getting back to uh, the Labour Temple in the Hoito, as I mentioned, this was, uh, this was a cooperative venture. Um, they, um, they didn't pay out dividends, so it was a consumer's cooperative. Um, and what they would do is that uh, when times were good, they would lower the price of meals. And in lean times, they would increase the, the price of meals. And the, the uh, cooperative ownership model um, served the, the, the constituents, who's mainly bumper workers, uh, extremely well. Um, the, the, the restaurant was very responsive to, uh, to what their needs were. And I think it's, it, it's probably worthwhile to, to point out that the cooperative ownership model in the instance of, of the Hoito restaurant was a very robust, um, uh, ownership model. Um, meaning that, you know, the, the restaurant launches, uh, today, as a matter of fact, May 1st, 1918, um, and it operates as a cooperative until 1975, um, and at, at, and then in 1975 it was taken by the the Finnish organization that uh, cultural organization that operated the hall. But in that time period, it had navigated uh, the Spanish influenza. It had navigated the Great Depression, um, the uh, stagnation and the oil shocks in the 1970s. So. Um, in terms of successes, it was a very uh, robust ownership model. It didn't collapse um, uh, despite these pressures, not to mention political uh, repression as well. Um, so, and um, I'll, I'll leave it at that, but I will uh, give a shout out to, uh, to the Finlandia Cooperative, which I'm a part of. Um, I'm an executive member and we're trying furiously to um, to save the Hoito restaurant and relaunch it actually as a as a cooperative. So um, so hopefully uh, watch this space or hopefully um, you know we'll, we'll be successful in that endeavor. And and yeah, I mean Hoito is always a highlight. The Finn pancakes uh, every time I go to Thunder Bay for sure. Um, and and I. I I feel like I have a much higher stake than I should as somebody who lives in Montreal and like really wanting it to come back. But, um, but, but just to follow up, like how did the, um, 
the cooperative, how did that sort of fit into people's um, vision of socialism or vision of like whatever was going to replace capitalism? Sure. Um, I'm not sure that it always did. Um, so I think that for a lot of the Finnish Wobblies, um, and they, they write about this in the, in the 1920s and in the 1930s, where uh, they, they didn't view uh, cooperatives as such as being the institutions that were going to replace capitalism. So from the IWW lens, what they want to do is build militant industrial unions uh, that would at some stage be powerful enough uh, to, um, to topple capitalism. And, and, create, in essence, workers' councils to, um, to run the economy. So um, they, uh, the, the vision of, of cooperatives wasn't, um, wasn't always necessarily, there wasn't a one-to-one -one relationship between uh, what's going to happen um, now and what's going to happen in the future. But, um, but you do also get a lot of writing talking about how uh, some of these halls were miniature working examples of the society in the future today. So, uh, and cooperatives certainly were, um, were an element uh, of that. Um, I think that uh, if you look at uh, some of the, the Finnish uh, working class and left movements, uh, cooperatives sort of emerged as uh, not necessarily as part of a revolutionary vision for the future, but as something like you know, there's so many of us that have the same vision, same beliefs, uh, belong to the same movement, um, and we, we have to spend money. Uh, why aren't we spending money in our own stores, basically? And, um, and you know, these it, within organizations that we democratically control ourselves and that are uh, more responsive to our, uh, to our needs and desires. So um, I think that's at least part of the outlook of uh, when it comes to cooperatives uh, within the Finnish left, certainly. Great, yeah, same, same question to Cassandra, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm really curious to hear more about how the, um, you know, wh whether, whether cooperatives were prefiguring the sort of alternative to capitalism or whether it was just a purely pragmatic thing or, or yeah, more about that relationship. Yeah, so it was it was um, it was similarly conceptualized by members of the ULFTA. They saw it as a as a sort of temporary holdover um, that could just make people's lives better in the meantime. Um, but they also saw it as that kind of in that kind of community building dynamic where might as well spend money at our own places. Um, and there was also a, a, a practical component in that um, these co-ops employed people. Um, so they were actually a great place to slide folks in who lost work or couldn't find any other work, you know, who might have been blacklisted from um, certain employment opportunities. So there, there were those kinds of um, very practical considerations in place. So the, um, the ULFTA had, I already mentioned the kind of financial co-op, which is the, the Workers Benevolent Association, which is uh, set up in 1922, and this is kind of um, health insurance, death benefits. Um, so that was sort of the, the one co-op they had, and then they had um, the, the People's Co-op, uh, which was established in, in 1928. Um, and it primarily uh, provided its members with um, uh, fuel, lumber, and, and dairy, dairy being the sort of biggest one. Um, so there, there, there were uh, two of them. Um, sort of operative um operative in well i guess nationally but but primarily like they were based in winnipeg so the winnipeg got sort of the most uh, use out of the, the co-ops what was their sort of picture of post-capitalism was was that something that was discussed or was it just kind of like like we know we have to overthrow it and you know what's going to happen is clearly better but yeah, I'm just curious, like, what, what was the picture of the post-capitalist future that they were working with? Yeah, I think, I, I think it really depends on, on when you, you drop yourself in, right? Um, in the early 20th century, um, until the 1930s, but let's, you know, conserve, we'll say the 1940s, um, this really was sort of a um, full-fledged overthrow capitalism, full communism uh, sort of idea. That really changes or it starts to change. It really becomes less and less 
um, what the, the replacement of the ULFTA, which is the Association of United Ukrainian Canadians, um, which uh, replaces the ULFTA in 1940 after the ULFTA is outlawed for a multitude of reasons, sort of drops the class struggle in those very explicit terms. And part of this is um, because of directives from uh, the Soviet Union. Part of this is because they're facing massive repression from the state. Um, part of this is because they're being attacked by um, right-wing Ukrainians and they just, they just cannot handle it. And part of this is also, um, some historians have written on uh, this idea of a generation gap where the, the movement was creating these really organic, uh, this is kind of generation of really organic activists who understood exactly what capitalism was interacted with it and knew that you know we needed a better way forward but for their children and their children's children um, that wasn't really as prominent and so a lot of their membership became really interested in participating only in the cultural front now there was politics imbued in that they weren't you know they weren't voting conservative they weren't voting liberal but it just wasn't the same they weren't sort of advancing the same goals it basically disappears and there's a little bit of lip service paid to sort of revolutionary politics but um it it, it becomes very clear that that's just not really what um what the sort of movement is officially about uh in during the war and then in the post-war period but certainly at its sort of heyday in, in, in the, you know, from the 19, you know, I mean, we'll say from 1896 to, to sort of 19, uh, 1939, that's the case. It's, it's very explicit. And so, sorry, so, so before that, like what, what did people think that were, was going to replace capitalism? Was, was, there a, was there like, did people talk about what it would look like and what it would be like, or was it, was it just clear that it would just be better to not have capitalism? Um, it really, it, it, again, it sort of really depended on, on who you asked. There was a lot of like sort of very utopian visions. Um, a lot of just like, we'll have full communism, full stop. That doesn't need a description or an explanation. Um, there was a lot of, a lot more specifics about like how we'll get to the revolution and sort of how we should fight the revolution. Um, and sort of less about the specifics of, of sort of what a post-capitalist society would look like. Um, so yeah, there's not really a sort of clear understanding. I think at least in what survives in, in the records is that I think all these things were certainly discussed and there was probably a very clear cut plan. I'm not meaning to suggest that they sort of didn't think it through, but it's sort of what we, I can consume as a historian. It's like, it's just a sort of taken for granted thing that we'll have full communism, right? And, and Saku is, it, it, um, is the sort of like, like the the fading of the of the political thing is it, it, would you say it's mainly a, is it a combination of repression and the sort of incul in, inculcation into uh, into like a mushy Canadian social democratic viewpoint among the sort of second generation and third generation or what what, what do you see happening there? Um. You know, a, a, like a real combination of things, and you know, I, I again, I, I would echo, um, you know, Cassandra's points. Is is there are different views expressed at at different points in time, and again, the the this story of the Finnish left is is very much a story of factionalism as well. So you know, you can go all the way back to the beginning of the twentieth century to uh, Malcolm Island off the northeast coast of uh, Vancouver Island to Sointula, which was formed as a um, utopian socialist uh, community. And, and they tried, uh, they had a vision of, of achieving some sort of um, living example of utopian so socialism in the here and now. Um, and that community collapsed or that experiment collapsed uh, largely as a result of a, um, a combination of a fire and uh, an underbidding on the construction of a bridge. So. You know their their vision of of kind of building this living utopia in the here and now uh, was of course very much limited by the the, the reality that they were still um, they they can't get outside of the of market relations out of outside of capitalist uh, relations. But I think you get a, a lot more um, how should I say it um, enthusiasm and um, you know dreaming big uh, in the in the sort of in the interwar period. You know, especially after the, the the Russian Revolution, 
and you know workers have now toppled uh, the czarist empire and uh, and also uh, through a revolution they've they pulled themselves out of the war uh, as well so uh, you know th this this gave inspiration to a lot of working class movements around the world um, and and that was of course expressed within immigrant communities here in Canada where there was a real feeling that uh, that worldwide revolution uh, in those years, and of course you have other things like the Winnipeg General Strike in 1919, and uh, you know Northern Ontario at this time through the 1920s, there was scarcely a year or a logging season where there wasn't a, a really large strike. So I think at that point you have a lot of dialogue, but similar uh, to the Ukrainian left is there's a lot of debate about um, the strategy to get there in the first place. So. The Finnish Organization of Canada very much had a, a working model, if you will, of what they imagined at least the socialist stage to look like, uh, which was, was the Soviet Union. Uh, the Wobblies, on the other hand, they didn't have the prestige of saying, you know, here's the working example of this of the society we want to build. But, uh, you know, they had um, um, a, a different image of, of building industrial unions. Uh, in essence, creating workers' councils, organizing entire supply chains, um, and instituting what they called sometimes industrial democracy, sometimes um, the cooperative commonwealth. Um, but I, I think there was a period, um, especially in the in the early 1920s, where there's a real feeling that that something something can happen, something big can happen, um, and it was always kind of conceptualized too. I mean, similar to uh, the, the, the Communist Party side and the IWW side is it was very much conceived, at least in these early years, as a uh, as an internationalist vision. It wasn't um, it wasn't a vision of uh, of a socialist Canada, say it was a vision of a socialist Canada that belonged to a um, to a, so a global socialist uh, society. So um, and again, you know, th the 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 nitty gritty of that, what that looks like in practice, um, really varied depending on depending on on who you talk to. Um, and as that as you go through the 20th century, um, you know the the Soviet Union now looks like it's a very stable entity. Uh, it's real, so called real existing socialism. Uh, that's what we can expect, and we can we can expect to be in this socialist period indefinitely until we have uh, we finally reach full communism at some um, ill-defined uh, later stage <laughs> um, where there's a way that's right that's right and with the and then with the with the union folks with um or with the iww folks uh what you find is uh, after the 1930s at least in logging it's uh it's much harder to um to uh, administer or to um, uh, to sustain um, a union like the IWW, and this especially changes in the in the mid nineteen forties when um, Canada passes uh, the, the the legislation, the federal government PC one zero zero three, which of course creates the, the 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 foundations for collective bargaining, which still exists today, uh, and the no strike clause as as being a, a component. Um, of any union contract, which of course was something that uh, the Wobblies could not accept, um, the, the ability to withdraw your labor uh, at, at um, any limitations on that were seen as being um, uh, too much of a concession. So, uh, so you have the, the, the growth, the rapid growth of, of labor unions uh, in Canada, but you have a, a decline of the sort of um, uh, rank and file controlled uh, unions like like the IWW. They, I mean, none of this went completely extinct, but it becomes an atmosphere that's very difficult uh, for them to operate in. And I think, sort of, um, uh, this has an impact on their on their vision of what's possible and and what um, you know what can be achieved in in our life lifetimes and and what that might look like. Absolutely. Um just to come back to cooperatives for just a second, um, would it be accurate to, to characterize the sort of orientation toward cooperatives as sort of a, an extension of the, the process of building power? So, you know, you're building power in relation to production on the one hand, but then you're building power 
you know, through consumption, on the other hand, to create some, like some ab ability to, to control more of the sort of immediate economy around you, the service economy, shall we say, um, in terms of, you know, food and, uh, and supplies. Um, it, you know, is that accurate? And, and I guess if, if so, um, I'm, I'm curious um, uh, if you have any sort of thoughts on, on how that, that relationship to like consumer cooperatives specifically uh, has sort of changed over the years. Um, yeah, I mean, um, in, in terms of building power, I mean, uh, you know, one area that, that, uh, that the cooperatives um, had, a, had a, uh, maybe a more significant impact that way was in with, within farming communities. So, you know, it wasn't just in uh, urban communities where there were, um, where there, there were these socialist halls. These were a feature of a lot of rural uh, communities as well. And if you look into the environment or into the um, area outside of Thunder Bay, the rural areas, a lot of these had Finnish communities uh, where uh, th that were largely farming communities. So it wasn't uncommon that, um, you know, these, these communities, these families would eke out a living on um, farming in the, in the summer and, you know, when, when in the, the appropriate seasons and then go off to the logging camps uh, in the winter. But um, especially when it comes to dairy, um, you know, you, the uh, cooperatives, um, you, you know, producer cooperatives were actually really instrumental in this after pasteurization. So people had to buy specialized equipment and it was the, the, the easiest thing would be to pool resources and, and to do that together. But so, you know, you had the, the, the cooperation there, but oftentimes um, uh, or you know, almost as a rule that, that those products would then be sold um, through the cooperative stores in the, in the urban environments and through places like the Hoito. I, you know, the Hoito purchased its milk from a cooperative dairy for decades. Um, other cooperative produce uh, came through those doors from these rural communities. So um, there was a, a sense of power and there was a sense of um, uh, a, a sort of a miniature sort of localized economy uh, that wasn't perfect by any stretch because, you know, the, the thin soil in a lot of these areas wasn't uh, especially conducive uh, to farming. Um, and, you know, it, and it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't possible for people at that stage anyway, to, to have that as being their sole work. Like they'd have to still take work in the winter, but at least they had a market uh, for their goods and there was some, uh, sort of reciprocity there. So I was just, uh, as sort of an aside, I was just reading um, an account from a 19th century Marxist who was talking about the, all the different kinds of cooperatives that were happening. He's like, well, there's liberal cooperatives, you know, there's Catholic cooperatives, and then there's socialist cooperatives. And you can basically tell the socialist cooperatives, and I'm sort of paraphrasing here, but because they'll sell you ammunition in order to fight the final battle for human liberation, basically. Um, and I'm just, I, I mean, I, I thought that was hilarious, but, but at the same time, um, I'm just, just curious, Cassandra, if you have any sort of thoughts on, um, uh, on, on the different, different orientations toward cooperation, if, if any, um, you know, that, that you see in the, in the literature and, um, and if there's, if there's a, a political critique uh, of, of, or any debate at all, I guess, about the different kinds of cooperation that are happening in that context. Yeah, not that I can think of in, in the Ukrainian example. I think it was a very, they had a very practical approach to the, the co-ops. It was, as we sort of talked about earlier, it was really about providing some kind of work opportunity. And I think as Saku rightly points out, it wasn't necessarily some a, a sort of full-time place to either uh, work or something you could rely on full time, but it might be a sort of kind of part time relationship, but it um, provided some kind of working opportunities. Um, it helped you save money, it helped you sort of reinvest in your community, it united the community. Um, the the co op was involved in political causes, it often like spoke out about, um, you know, things like, you know, government subsidies, it spoke out about organized labor, it spoke out about international affairs, it strongly supported, um, you know, the, the communist line, and then the, the Labour Progressive Party after it, it did that kind of political work. But 
I'm not, um, as, as far as I'm aware at least, um, I'm not sure that they had a kind of um, intellectual line on it. it. It felt very just like, we're doing this, we're not thinking about it, it serves our community's needs, off we go, right? Interesting. I mean, I just find it curious that, you know, on the one hand, people are advocating for the overthrow of capitalism. On the other hand, they're creating these are very, like, extremely democratic economic institutions, but there's, there doesn't seem to be a, a connection between the two. Yeah, I, I, I think on, on, on some level, that's, that's correct. But I, I think also that this is what's, what's, what's so unique about about Hall Socialism in that, you know, it was interested in this bigger political project of overthrowing capitalism, but they weren't just going to sit around in the meantime and sort of not do anything. So they did everything they possibly could to sort of, um, you know, educate, agitate, um, feed, clothe, protect, all of that was sort of being done. But yeah, there, 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 I think there is a little bit of that. Um, I think it's a bit less pronounced if you look at the leadership um, or if you look at the folks who are um, communicating with the Comintern. I think there's sort of a clear, uh, sort of clear line there. But um, yeah, it's 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 like there there is something a little less um, radical, I guess you could say, about what they're we're do, they're doing on the ground. But um, I think it was very successful. So yeah, it sounds it sounds incredibly vital. Um, Saku, I just wanted to pick up one one thread, not to end on a on a on a <laughs> negative note necessarily, but um, but the factionalism. Uh, I'm I'm just curious how you see it, sort of with the benefit of historical hindsight. Do you feel like it was you know petty bickering? Were there were there really substantial differences that were worth the cost of those splits? Um, were they um, you know w would there been a, have been a pathway to to be more unified and more effective as a result or not? I, I think that, you know, today in the left, we kind of snicker at some of the, the, the past factionalism. And of course, everybody thinks back, or I think back to um, the Monty Python uh, bit in the, in the life of Brian with the, the people's front of Judea and all this kind of stuff, which is this really clever critique of, uh, of Trotskyist factionalism uh, in particular, but, um, you know, I think if you uh, if you look at these movements seriously and you give them the benefit of the doubt of, you know, they lived through those times and, and we didn't, um, you know, and, and you look at the, the big heady debates, especially after the, the, the Russian Revolution and the, the formation of the Communist International, the Comintern, and the kinds of debates about how workers of the world should be orienting themselves to to the Soviet line and um, and to you know if if the uh, Communist Party truly had the legitimacy to to claim leadership over the, the world revolution um, you know these are these are really important debates and I, I wish if I had a time machine I think I'd like to go back into one of these logging camps in and around, you know, 1919, maybe, or 1920, and just be a fly on the wall and observe some of these, uh, some of these, these heated debates and these heated ideological debates. And they did inform, you know, what, what we're supposed to do next is the, you know, is the maneuver to, uh, to build a political party and to contest elections and to have that political party be a, sort of, um, you know, the, 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 the sort of main emphasis of our, of, of our activity, um, or is that, a, is that a dead end and, you know, can, can bourgeois politics ever be really reformed and can bourgeois institutions ever really be reformed in that way? So, you know, I think that the, the debates were, were actually, um, were really important. Um, but having said that, um, a, a unified force in the logging camps, I think, uh, would have been much more effective. Um, when big strikes were called, the CP unions and the IWW actually um, collaborated really well together uh, as, uh, just as a matter of survival. You have to have, you know, we want everybody out, so you have to have joint strike committees, uh, you have to have um, cooperation, coordination. Um, but at the same time, I mean, with the, the Finnish-Canadian um, communists in Northern Ontario, they always had this, this vision of, of, of wanting to 
uh, be involved with the American Federation of Labor or the uh, Trades and Labor Congress affiliated unions. Uh, and this is going back into the 19 teens and, and through the 1920s was they, they accused the, the IWW of being uh, dual unionists, of creating competing radical unions that were uh, impeding efforts for unity. Um, but in a lot of industries, there wasn't an AFL union to speak of. In, in Northern Ontario, there, there was no um, AFL or, or TLC union. The, the craft unionists, they weren't concerned with, you know, quote unquote, unskilled labor. They weren't concerned with uh, labor that didn't go through an apprenticeship process. Um, and a lot of them weren't concerned with the plight of, uh, of lowly immigrant labor either. So, um, you know, the, the, the unions that they built, they, they didn't have those affiliations, um, but yet you had two of them. You, you had the, the Lumber Workers Industrial Union of Canada and the BIWW version. Um, that changes in the mid 1930s uh, when the, the CP union finally um, affiliates with uh, the United Brotherhood of Carpenters becomes uh, lumber and saw. And it's this kind of short-lived victory because by the 1950s, uh, the, during the McCarthy era, all the communists were purged. Um, so the communist leadership of, of lumber and saw were, uh, were purged. So they kind of had this, um, this half victory where finally the AFL, the big guys are listening to us and they're gonna back us. Um, and uh, only to, to have that result then in the, in the 1950s. But, um, but yeah, I, I think that the debates, the, the debates were important and ultimately the factionalism uh, in, in many instances, it, it impeded, uh, I think it was, it was regrettable. I think it, it did impede uh, broader uh, working class unity. Interesting. Um, yeah, it's interesting what you're saying about the, the sort of, um, you know, the, the, these like existential sort of debates about how, how things are, what's going to happen next and so on. In some ways, I, I feel like I sort of crave that <laughs> on the left. I feel like there's, there's a, you know, there's, certainly there's people who write essays about these things, but, but there aren't, there aren't any like broad based debates where you have like a bunch of working class people being like, this is the way forward for the left. No, this is, you know, like we don't, it doesn't feel, um, like like the there's anything with enough momentum to to warrant that but um but i guess on that note i'm sort of curious you know being steeped in this history uh as well as your own political activism um you know what are the sort of um you know fu future directions or or um you know yeah what do you see as the sort of um the, just sort of the next step forward i guess like what what would you prioritize um, for, I think something I would really like to see is 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 not necessarily a, a return to hall socialism exactly how it looked, um, but you know I've alluded to this a few times. I think that there are some really important things we can take away in terms of figuring out how to organize big groups of people um, and how to organize them in a way that doesn't entirely revolve around um, sort of just explicit politics. Um, I think there's something to be said for um, organizing along kind of, um, kind of cultural, familial, emotional lines that really build something quite organic. And that's a little bit easier, or sorry, a little bit harder uh, to dismantle. Um, so something, you know, I know that there are groups already doing this in different, in, in sort of different ways, but, you know, I was at a, a, a conference in, in Alberta, um, a, oh gosh, I was going to say a year ago, but I don't, uh, I don't know, I have no idea what year it is anymore. It could have been 10 years ago now for all I know, but in the pre-times, uh, I was at a conference in, in Alberta that was, um, held at, um, a labor temple, um, and, 
we were talking about, you know, what could we, what can we do to move forward? And, and it kind of dawned on me in that moment, we were all sitting in this room and we had, where we were in breakout groups and we were, we all got a piece of paper and a pen to sort of like write our vision for the future. And it sort of dawned on me in that moment that like just doing that is exactly what we should be doing is having conversations, returning to spaces where we can be like fed and entertained and learn about history and learn about politics and sort of like agitate and hear from union organizers and hear from community activists and sort of all come together and sort of do that work. Um, so I don't know, I mean, maybe that sounds a little bit hokey, maybe sort of um, some hardened activists are gonna hear this and roll their eyes, but I think some kind of injection of, of the, the core tenets of, of Hall socialism would be really helpful for the left. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I, I feel like in, in so many ways, because all the other spaces are sort of taken up by these NGOs and sort of like depoliticized government funded cultural organizations and all these different things that you, the left ends up sort of siloing itself and being like, this is where we do pure politics. But in some ways, it really resonates what you're saying is that maybe, maybe taking that bait and, 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 and sort of, you know, creating a you know creating these spaces that are like you must you must have this much <laughs> ideological conformity to enter the room um you know and and, and also like we're not going to do anything but just talk politics here um maybe isn't the best way forward um what are you what are your thoughts uh, saku yeah i mean i think really one of the strengths of hall socialism was its inclusivity and i'd like to see that a lot more in the left and you know, maybe in a in a way that um, a lot of folks don't think about when you when you talk about inclusivity. But you you know you, these these halls existed in in working class communities, and they accepted their working class members, warts and all. Um, there wasn't this uh, missionary, or I mean, certainly there were some people that that just wanted to talk politics. But the the, the general thrust was that you know. Um, you, you come in and it's it's through this activity it's through it's through activity and through through struggle that you're changed and it, it doesn't happen by um filling your head up with all the right ideas and then creating a a cadre of saints to go around and, and make everybody have the, the perfect political ideas um there there's this messy process and i kind of say half jokingly uh, you know, if I were to summarize that that lesson of inclusivity when it comes to political organizing is that uh, it's a mark of, of political maturity if you're able to organize alongside somebody who doesn't have share your cultural or subcultural tastes, you know, so if you're politically or if you're community organizing, politically organizing, union organizing, uh, certainly um, you have to be able to relate to people who listen to like Nickelback, right? Um, and no, no, you, no, no, you no. have to be able to. <laughs> <laughs> no, see, this That's is why I draw the line. Jokingly. This is why I said I'm joking. <laughs> but, um, you you need to um, you know you need to have that 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 broader view. You know these are and these are attempts to build mass movements, uh, mass movements of of working people. Um, and, and you need to, find, to be able to find ways to, um, to include people you need to have, you know, I think the, the whole socialist experience had a, a, a fairly low uh, entry level bar, right? Um, you, you know, anybody was allowed to, to participate in the, in the events or to, or to come see plays or, or whatever, but it was through that activity that they become transformed as um, as individuals. And I think that's a healthier way uh, to, to view, and I think a more accurate way to view uh, struggle and, and social change. That's a great note to end it on. So thanks so much to both of you for joining us on Half Past Capitalism. Um, this, like, before we sign off, uh, I just wanted to ask you both is, uh, and you're both prolific uh, writers and um, and and I guess in Cassandra's case, you, you were you authored a graphic novel as well. Um, I'm I'm just curious if you each have like one thing that you'd want people to read uh, about uh, your respective topics uh, that you want to. And, and then, of course, if there's any social media um, that you want to plug, please do that too. Cassandra, you want to start? 
I am not on social media, um, but you can find my email by Googling me if you want to chat. Um, I think actually the, 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 you plugged it for me. I think uh, if you want to learn a little bit about uh, the Ukrainian left, how it intersects with um, sort of politics and ethnicity and capitalism, um, go check out Enemy Alien, A True Story of Life Behind Barbed Wire, which is out with Between the Lines. I, I'm not going to plug any work, particularly. I'm, I'm just going to plug the uh, the Finlandia Cooperative again. So, um, so, so uh, keep a keep a lookout for that. Um, you know, we're we're hoping that we can reopen the the um, the restaurant uh, next year. It'll be under uh, cooperative ownership structure, uh, consumers cooperative. So, um, so I would just I would just plug that. Um, and like Cassandra, I'm not really on on social media. I uh, I kind of goofing around with Twitter a little bit, but nothing that, uh, nothing necessarily that I want to plug, but, um, a lot of my stuff is, is, uh, is online. Um, so if you, if you search me up, um, you can find my contact information. You can find a lot of, uh, what I've written about, uh, these topics and, and others. So. Great. Well, thanks again to you both, uh, for coming on the show and, um, happy May Day. Thank you. Happy May Day. Happy Mayday.